<clears throat> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation. If you look at the way that most <clears throat> investigations go, you have a witness to some criminal event. That witness is going to be interviewed repeatedly. So the, the witness will be interviewed by the first officer on the scene. There will probably be a detective interviewing this person. Either later that day, a few days later, the detective might re-interview the witness. Uh, the witness might have to give a statement to the attorneys. The witness uh, might appear in court more than once. So you have all of these repeated interviews, and clearly that becomes an important issue in the trial itself um, for reasons that we'll get to. However, there's very little research on repeated interviewing. Uh, I suspect that it has to do with the fact that it's very labor intensive to do that type of research. <clears throat> especially if you're doing it in, in the form of a conventional interview. Um, so you have to conduct a one-on-one -on -one interview, you tape record that interview, you transcribe the interview, you conduct a second interview, you transcribe that second interview, and then you start comparing the responses from the first interview to the responses of the second interview. And if it's a naturalistic kind of interview, it's very, very difficult and very time consuming to compare individual answers. Almost all of the theories about memory are about memory when tested once. B basically, we don't know a whole lot um, about what happens when you interview people more than once. There are some assumptions that are made within the legal system about what happens when you interview people more than once. So one of the things that I'd like to do is to examine some of, the, some of those assumptions that appear within the legal system itself. Why do you conduct more than one interview? Well, one possibility is that it's an opportunity to collect additional information. Second is that you can compare the answers from the first interview to the second interview, and so you can get some measure of consistency. And consistency is a factor that's used uh, very, very frequently to determine whether or not witnesses are credible. So uh, we use consistency both as a measure of memory accuracy, <clears throat> that is witnesses who are inconsistent are deemed to have weak memories, or we use consistency or rather inconsistency to make some inferences about veracity. So we make this reasonable assumption that witnesses who are consistent may be deceptive. And that's what I'd like to examine um, so I have, I have five basic questions that I want to address. First question is, um, in fact, how likely are witnesses to generate new information on the second interview that they haven't generated on the first interview? And in some sense, it's counterintuitive because obviously more, pa more time passes from the crime to the second interview than to the first interview. So you can understand why somebody would think that there shouldn't be very many new pieces of information coming up on the second interview because a longer time has passed and everybody knows that memory degrades with the passage of time. So why would anybody in his or her right mind expect that you could remember some events two weeks after an event that you couldn't remember a day after an event? If people do remember things um, on a second interview that they don't recall earlier, which we usually refer to as the phenomenon of reminiscence, can we trust those recollections? Again, because they seem to violate common sense understanding of memory. So how, how accurate um, are these recollections that occur only on the later interview? Um, there are other kinds of inconsistency. So one form of inconsistency is not remembering something initially, and then you remember that fact on a second interview. <clears throat> but there is a reverse. You could remember something on the first interview and then fail to remember that event on a second interview. We'll refer to that as a forgotten item. And then there's another kind of inconsistency where you could remember an event one way one time, and then you remember it a different way on the second time. So you remember the perpetrator as being clean shaven on the first interview, and you remember the perpetrator as having a beard on the second interview. Well, clearly, you have now a contradiction. So one of the things that we want to look at then is does it make a difference whether you're inconsistent via this reminiscence, remembering something later that you didn't remember earlier, 
or you're inconsistent because you remembered earlier but not later, or you're inconsistent because you have changed your answer completely, you now give a contradictory response to what you said earlier. Fourth, and this is one of the critical questions, is are witnesses who are very inconsistent, are they generally <coughs> inaccurate? That is, is their entire testimony likely to be inaccurate and therefore discounted <coughs> because they were inconsistent on several items? And then we'll take a look at the issue of inconsistency, not so much as a predictor of memory accuracy, but as a predictor of veracity. That is, to what degree are witnesses who make a few inconsistencies, to what degree are they more likely to be lying than those witnesses who are consistent? By and large, if you have reasonable witnesses, they should be relatively consistent. So we're not talking about anybody changing their answers radically from the first interview to the second. Anybody who takes the task seriously, most of their responses are going to be consistent, but still, um, some people make more inconsistencies than do others. So let's take a look at these five questions. Um, I'll describe it in the context of one particular experiment, but this one particular experiment uh, done by Gilbert and Fisher in 2006 is representative of a whole slew of experiments. Um, and then I'll report some data, not only from this particular experiment, but I'll describe data that's a conglomeration of research with over 20 separate experiments. In the Gilbert and Fisher experiment, it conforms to the standard procedure that's used in most of these multi-interview experiments. That is, the witnesses see an event. Typically, it's a videotape of a simulated crime. In some cases, it's a live event. <clears throat> it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. They see an event, and then they're interviewed twice. The first interview could be anywhere from a few minutes to a day or two after the target event. The second interview could be anywhere from several days up until two or three weeks after the target event. Um, the kinds of questions that we asked in this particular experiment were either free narrative questions on the order of describe what happened in this videotape that you saw, or they would be what I would call a guided recall. That is, there was still a, it was generally a free narrative, but there was a direction you were supposed to take, as in describe in chronological order the events, of the, the events that were depicted in the video, or describe what you saw in this room uh, from scanning from left to right. Okay? So it's still a kind of open-ended narrative, it's just that you're giving some guidance as to how you want the witness to describe that event. All right, so let's get to question number one. Question number one is how likely are witnesses to remember some events on a second interview that they didn't remember earlier? In the experiment that I just described to you, the one by Gilbert and Fisher, we have 192 subjects, uh, 189 of them, almost 98%, that's actually a little bit more than 98%, 98% of the subjects recall some events at time two that they don't recall at time one. That is, it's virtually a universal phenomenon. Each, and the average number of these reminiscent facts recalled is slightly over eight. So you have virtually everybody recalling several facts on the second interview that they don't recall in the first interview. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that when this comes up in court, the opposing attorney always jumps on this. And they always say something like, well, how is it possible for you to remember something three weeks after the event that you couldn't remember a day after the event? Everybody knows that memory gets worse with the passage of time. So who, who told you this information? Did the police officer give you this information that remember three weeks later? Did you speak to another witness? Did you learn it by... Uh, being uh, listening, to the, listening to the television. That is, it's inconceivable that this could have occurred by natural means. And what I suggest is that, in fact, it's a very reliable common phenomenon. We really do not have to go out of our way to generate extraordinary explanations of this reminisce, reminiscence phenomenon. It is virtually, I guarantee, to happen in any experiment where you allow witnesses to generate some kind of an open-ended narrative. 
Uh, we found that in our study, uh, there are several other studies, uh, and David LaRuis has found the same thing, uh, along with uh, uh, Yuan Turtle, along with Oberth, virtually everybody who does these experiments where you have uh, two opportunities to recall finds this phenomenon of reminiscence. It's one of the most stable findings uh, in all of psychology of memory. Okay. So now we get to the question that given this, that this happens reliably, can we really trust the recollections that occur only on the second interview? That is, how accurate are these reminiscent items that occur only on test number two, but don't occur on test number one? In the study that I described to you, where we look only at the reminiscent items, so the average accuracy, that is, um, you take the number of correct statements divided by the total number of statements that they make, the average accuracy rate is 0.87. That is, almost 90% of all of these reminiscent items are accurate. Well, maybe we shouldn't be challenging then the accuracy of these reminiscent items um, if, in fact, they're likely to be correct. Again, it sounds a little bit intuitive, uh, counterintuitive in that if the person was so sure about these items, why didn't the witness recall them initially? Well, I would suggest that there are good explanations for it, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that uh, momentarily. If you look at all of the research <coughs> that's been done using this double testing paradigm, Generally, you find that these um, reminiscent items are recalled with very high frequency, uh, with very high accuracy, if the question that led um, to these items being produced was an open-ended question. So, if the question is on the order of "describe the event to me," then those items are very likely to be accurate. There are some studies where the second test is not a free, open-ended narrative, but it's a set of very specific questions, as in was the uh, guy's hair black or, or, or light color? Um, did the car go east or did the car go west? Well, Europeans never know what you're talking about when you say east or west, but this direction or that direction. If you ask um, questions like that, that is, they're very, very specific questions, then if you get these reminiscent recollections, those recollections are not nearly as, uh, as likely to be correct. That is, the determinant of whether these reminiscent recollections are correct or not has to do more with the nature of the question. Open-ended questions yield accurate reminiscent recollections. Closed questions at time two yield inaccurate recollections. But that's pretty much the same rule as if you interview somebody only once. Responses to open-ended questions are generally extremely high. Responses to closed questions are considerably lower. That is, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference uh, whether you are asking people on the second interview or on the first, uh, on the first interview. Uh, the principle that governs accuracy has to do with the nature of the question, and that's the same for reminiscent items as it is if you're testing items individually. That is, there's really not a whole lot going on that's all that unique at the, si at the time of the second interview. What about other kinds of inconsistency? Remember we said that there are three, generally three kinds of inconsistency. Uh, there are these reminiscent items where you remember at a time two but not at time one. There are forgotten items which are remembered at time one but not at time two. And then there are contradictions. So let me, um, let me show you uh, the data for these various kinds of items. So these are the scores for the time one data. Uh, as you see, consistent items are recalled. They're very likely to be correct. Not a whole lot more likely than forgotten items. Much more likely to be correct than contradictory items. Time two, consistent items are a little bit more, but not exceedingly more likely to be correct than reminiscent items. Again, contradictory items are likely to be incorrect. Those are the, really the ones that you have to be concerned about. That is, we need to make a distinction between inconsistencies that are forgotten items versus reminiscent items 
versus contradictory items. And the only ones that we clearly have to worry about are the contradictory items. Um, even though the reminiscent items and the forgotten items are not quite as high as the consistent items, by and large, they're relatively high and they're almost as high as the consistent items. One of the concerns that I have is that when you see judges' instructions about pay attention to consistency, is that they don't distinguish between one kind of inconsistency and another. It's as if they lump all kinds of inconsistencies together, and I think that they're missing the major part of the story. That is, to the degree that jurors are instructed about paying attention to inconsistency, you really have to pay attention mainly to contradictions. Okay, uh, let's get to Next question. <clears throat> Next question is, if you have a witness who makes several inconsistent responses, to what degree should you not believe that witness's entire testimony? And that's really the issue here. Um, actually, it was interesting because um, Steve Redford and, and, uh, and Ian uh, Hines and, and I were talking about this issue last night, and Steve and Ian and were talking to me about uh, several, on several cases where in essence, the judge um, threw out the case because the witness made a few inconsistent statements. As if the judge believed that because the witness made a few inconsistent statements, therefore the entire testimony, not just those few items that were inconsistent, but the entire testimony should be thrown out. The question is whether that is a reasonable hypothesis. Is that a reasonable working assumption? Well, it's common within the law, if you look at the instructions that judges give to jurors, and this is in Florida, but it's pretty much the same thing um, all over. That as you're instructing jurors to pay attention to these inconsistencies as if they tell you something about the credibility of the witness. Not only do they form natural instructions, but it's also common legal strategy, uh, as um, Francisca Ainsworth pointed out, you try to generate an inconsistent response in the opposing witness. So here are some suggestions from Bailey Rothblatt's kind of a classic book on legal strategy. If you can, manufa if you can manufacture these inconsistencies, basically you have, uh, you have uh, wiped out this opposing, uh, this opposing witness. And this is pretty much the strategy. It's probably the main strategy that attorneys use on cross-examination. Let me demonstrate that this witness is inconsistent. And then via the vehicle of the judge's instructions, the jury will not believe this person, and I will win the case. Now, this is predicated on the assumption that witnesses who make more inconsistent responses are generally less accurate. Okay? And that's why you shouldn't believe witnesses who make several of these inconsistent responses. It's something that jurors resonate to. If we ask, either, either we do um, questionnaires and we ask people um, what would uh, indicate to you that the witness is not credible, they would say if the witness is inconsistent. <laughs> we do experimental mock jury studies. We find that when jurors are exposed to witnesses who give several inconsistent statements, uh, they're less likely to trust those, uh, those witnesses. Question is, I really don't care who believes this. My concern as a psychologist is, is it true? I mean, it could be the case that lots of people believe it. Not very long ago, lots of people believed that the earth was flat. So would it be reasonable for an attorney to make an argument based on this assumption that the earth is flat? Because you can make a very convincing argument. I mean, it looks flat. You don't have any evidence that it's not flat. So if this is the... Uh, 10th century, um, you can make a pretty good argument that you should follow my instructions because the Earth is flat. What happens if the Earth is not flat? Well, let's take a look then at what the data uh, suggests. The implication is that if you go through all of these studies and you get variation in witness inconsistency, after all, some witnesses are more consistent, some witnesses are less consistent. You get variation in accuracy. Some witnesses are more accurate, some witnesses are, are less accurate. So the guiding assumption behind this notion is that there ought to be a strong correlation between consistency and accuracy. 
that as witnesses who are more inconsistent ought to be on the whole less accurate. So in fact, what is the correlation between consistency and accuracy when you look at the empirical data? Well, it turns out that across approximately 19 or 20 different studies, the um, overall correlation between consistency and accuracy is about 0.18. And in fact, some of those studies give you a negative correlation. Well, that seems to pull the rug out under the most common strategy that's used within the legal system of demonstrating that witnesses are inconsistent. I mean, these results say, so what? Well, let's progress a little bit more then to uh, what about the argument that inconsistency is also a sign of veracity, <laughs> that is, witnesses who are inconsistent are more likely to be lying. Again, it's something that everybody believes. It seems implicit in the judge's instructions. You shouldn't believe these people. It's not clear whether you shouldn't believe them because they have weak memories or because they are lying, but uh, what does the research suggest when you look at studies on, uh, on deception? Is it the case that, in fact, witnesses who are inconsistent are more deceptive than witnesses who are consistent? Well, it turns out that there are two separate patterns of research in the data. There are some people, uh, namely people like uh, Perandis Granhug, who find that inconsistent witnesses are, excuse me, that um, deceptive witnesses are no less and no more inconsistent than truthful witnesses. And then there's another pattern of data, um, mainly by, um, um, uh, by Vry and myself, who find the opposite pattern, that inconsistency is a good predictor of, uh, inconsistency is a good predictor of deception. Well, why do we get these two different data patterns? That is, is there anything that's done systematically different in the research that Vry and I do than the research that Granhag does? Because we find clearly different patterns of data. Seems to me that the basic difference is that in the studies that Granhag does, I mean, he tends to ask, so it's not like one, one methodology is any better than the other, but in, in Granhag's methodology, he tends to ask uh, suspects questions like, what happened? Or where were you um, last Saturday night? There's, these are questions that are relatively easily anticipated. So you know that, and if you were here at, at my uh, talk yesterday, this is what we, what, this is what we had described, that um, suspects, especially people who are deceptive, should anticipate um, presenting an argument, uh, presenting an account of where they were. So they anticipate being asked a question like, where were you last Saturday night? And so therefore they prepare a story. If they prepare a story, uh, they can give that same story over and over and over again. And so not surprisingly, given that they can anticipate the questions, deceptive witnesses are extremely consistent. In the research that um, Vry and I do, um, we tend to ask more questions that are not easily anticipated, as in describe what you did yesterday, but describe it in reverse order. Or instead of describing who was at this party, draw a sketch. That is, you have to put each person in a particular location, which is not something that people anticipate. When you ask people these unanticipated questions, now you find that the pattern changes and that deceptive witnesses are less consistent than <clears throat> truthful witnesses. The point is that you really have to know what was the question that was being asked in order to interpret inconsistency. If the question was not anticipated, then inconsistency is a good predictor of deception. If the question could be easily anticipated, then inconsistency doesn't tell you a whole lot about, <clears throat> about deception. So the, the story is a lot more complex <clears throat> than it seems on the surface. And if you look at the way um, attorneys argue in the law, if you look at uh, what people <clears throat> believe intuitively, if you look at the instructions that judges give to juries, it seems pretty simple. All you have to do is find out if there's any in in inconsistency, and that ought to drive your decisions. But I submit that it's considerably more complex than that, and then we have to have some sense as to 
what causes people to give inconsistent responses. And there's not a whole lot of research on it. You really will not find any formal theories about inconsistency, in large part because we don't do that much research where we test people twice and measure consistency, and again, because um, it's, it's very labor intensive to do that. So let me, let me, let me uh, present to you uh, some informal hypotheses um, about what might lead to inconsistency, more in terms of cognitive theory. Well, clearly something has to change from the time of the first test until the time of the second test. The question is, what is it that changes? Well, one possibility is that the knowledge that's stored, the knowledge that's been encoded in the witness's mind is different at time two than it is at time one. Well, why would it be different? Well, one possibility is that you lose information over time, so events that were available at time one simply are not available at time two. Uh, second, you may have learned things from the first interview to the second interview. This is the, and this is the defense attorney's argument. The police told you this. That is, you didn't have this information when you were interviewed initially, but somehow you acquired this information from time one to time two. You spoke to the police, you spoke to the other witnesses, you read the newspaper, and so you have a different body of knowledge that could be accessed at time two that couldn't be accessed at time one. That's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation, and by the way, these are not mutually exclusive. You could have lots of things going on at the same time. Second possibility is that we use different retrieval methods to access this information. After all, you might be interviewed by a different person at time one than at time two. You're interviewed by the patrol officer at time one, who's probably not as sophisticated as the detective whom you're being interviewed at time two. Even if you're interviewed by the same person, they're likely to ask you somewhat different questions. And we know that the method that you use to retrieve information will determine in part what you recall. So perhaps this inconsistency doesn't reflect your knowledge, but it reflects the changing interviewing conditions. If it reflects the changing interviewing conditions, then why should this kind of inconsistency be taken as an indicator of the quality of your knowledge. A uh, third possibility um, is that your willingness to provide an answer that you're not certain about as your metacognitive control uh, might vary. So you may be very conservative on one interview and not guess, but you might be enticed to guess on another interview. Not surprisingly, if you're enticed to guess one time, uh, and you're led to be very conservative and not volunteer information another time, well, then you might say some things when you're enticed to guess that you would not say uh, when you're enticed to be conservative. But that might have to do with the nature of the questioning. So the judge says something on the order of make sure that you are absolutely certain before you volunteer any information in the courtroom. And maybe the police officer says, look, we don't have any other leads. We're absolutely dependent on you. So even if you're not sure, just tell me what you think might be the case. Well, not surprisingly, that's going to lead to these kinds of inconsistency. Again, these are not mutually exclusive. They may all be occurring at the same time, but I think that you have to have a sense of what are the dynamics in terms of cognitive theory about what is yielding these inconsistencies before you use those inconsistencies as the starting point for making a claim, I shouldn't trust this person. What about in terms of the veracity literature? <clears throat> Why would a liar be inconsistent? After all, you've prepared this answer. Well, one possibility is that it's simply difficult at time two to remember what you said at time one. And one of the strategies that liars use is that when they're interviewed later, they try to remember what they said earlier so that they will sound consistent. But maybe a lot of time passes between the time one interview and the time two interview, and so it becomes difficult to remember what you said earlier. Perhaps you're interviewed in two different settings. We know from the encoding specificity principle that the context influences your recollection. If the context of the time two interview is different enough from the context of the time one interview, so it may be difficult to retrieve that. Perhaps you were asked an unanticipated question at time one, and so you just generated an ad hoc response very quickly, which you didn't think about, 
because you felt obligated that you had to answer this question, since if you were there, certainly you would know the answer to this question. So it's something that you didn't process very thoroughly, you just blurted out an answer. Well, not surprisingly, if you blurt out lots of answers at time one, it will be difficult to remember at time two all of the things that you said at time one. Again, this is quite complex. We don't really know what leads to inconsistency, either as a product of the memory processes or as a product of this motivational process of attempting to be undeceptive. And so my concern is that in the legal world, there is almost a reflexive response to these inconsistencies as if it were so obvious that inconsistencies were markers of witnesses' poor memory or that they were being deceptive. And I think it's considerably more complex than that <clears throat> and that if we respond reflexively without having any insights about what caused this person to be inconsistent, we are going to wind up throwing out a lot of data, a lot of cases that we shouldn't. <clears throat> and I expect that in, in the cases that um, Stephen, Ian, and I were talking about, when the judge threw out many of these cases, um, these were probably cases um, where it could be explained why the witness was inconsistent and why those inconsistencies may not matter very much. Um, I, ga I gave this talk um, a few, well, probably two years ago, and an attorney asked a reasonable question. He said, look, the kinds of, on the kinds of questions that you ask people, are they about material issues in the case or are they about peripheral issues of the case? Well, at the time, I didn't really have a response for him because we didn't look at that systematically. Um, so one of, uh, one of my uh, students, John Carbone, did a study where we had, um, uh, well, um, professional uh, attorneys, attorney scholars, look at the videotape and they, they said that these items were material, that any case that involved um, uh, this kind of crime, these would be the material items, descriptions, if it were an identification case, then descriptions of the perpetrator uh, would be material issues. Let's say descriptions of the victim would be um, immaterial because the we already have the body of the victim there. Therefore, why is it so important that the witness remembers what the victim looked like? So we want to see whether the pattern of the lack of ability to predict accuracy via inconsistency, does that hold only for, let's say, peripheral items, or does it hold only for material items? Turns out that it holds for neither. That is the correlation between inconsistency and overall inaccuracy, that is testimonial inaccuracy, is equally weak for both. I think we don't really know whether inconsistency is very diagnostic or it's not. Um, I do think that the poets had some insights, um, specifically Ralph Waldo Emerson, who says, it's his classic line. Uh, with that, uh, I will end and listen to your questions.